All right, thank you very much, uh, Reverend Florence. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today's sharing is uh, from Titus. Um, all right. Today's sharing is from Titus. And chapter two, Titus chapter two from verse 11 to 12. Uh, and it says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. And then, um, the title for today is the power of the power of grace for the believer. The power of grace to a believer. All right. Um, maybe before I go any further, I could also pray. Have any further and thank you for the time that I would spend on this call uh, with your people. I pray that you will prepare every heart that is here. I pray, Lord, that. You'll use me um, as your vessel to communicate your word. May it be audible, may it be clear, and may it cut to the heart of someone, may it convict, may it reprove, may it teach, may it correct, so that these mainly God and women may be adequately equipped for every good work. In this mighty name of prayer, amen. All right, um, for us to better understand uh, this passage, um, these two verses, I think we will appreciate them better if we get the, the context of where Paul is coming from. So first of all, uh, we need to understand that this book, uh, Titus, was written by Paul. Uh, and Paul wrote uh, this letter or epistle um, to... Uh, Paul wrote this letter epistle to Titus. And... Um, when uh, he wrote this letter to him, when he had left him at Crete to oversee the establishment of the churches. So Paul, uh, I think it was his second missionary journey, had gone to Crete, and he left there Titus to establish these churches. Uh, we find that in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, which says, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city, as I directed you. So. Paul wrote the book, he wrote uh, all the piece of all this letter, he wrote it to Titus, and uh, we are seeing in um, Titus 1.5 the reason why he left him in Crete was so that he could appoint elders. Um, and then uh, he goes on to give qualifications for elders, and we see that in verse 7 to 8. It says that, that these overseers must be above reproach as God's stewards, not self-willed, not quick quickly tempered, not addicted to wine, um, not pugnacious, not fond of solid gain, but hospitable, loving, but is good and sensible, and just devout and self-controlled. So Paul goes on to give qualities of, um, tells Titus, look, when you're looking out for the people who are going to be elders, elders, I mean, uh, overseers or pastors or the people who will be in charge of the church, he gives him certain qualities. Remember, verse 5, it, the reason why he left him there is to set up the church. And then now he's telling them, telling uh, Titus, now look, uh, when you're looking out for men who are going to be elders in the church, these are supposed to be the qualities. He lists them down. That is verse um, Titus 1, 7 to 8. But then you will uh, we'll ask ourselves, what is the reason for having these qualities? Why is Paul insisting that these pastors or overseers uh, or elders have these qualities? I will see that in verse 9 of Titus 1. It says, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that, he, so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who, who contradict. So the reason why Paul... Uh, remember, verse 5, Paul leaves, uh, uh, first Paul goes to Crete, uh, uh, sets up churches there. He leaves Titus um, there to establish these churches. 
and and Titus, um, he then he writes his him this letter, giving him instructions on how what to do. The first one is the elders or the pastors or the leaders of the churches. He gives him the qualities in verse seven to eight, and now we're seeing what is what are the why is he emphasizing that these leaders or pastors should have these qualities. And we see that in verse nine, so that they will be able to teach sound doctrine and refute it. I, uh, that, that's what verse nine says. The, the reason why these people should have these qualities, one, they'll be mature and they'll be able to refute sound doctrine, but then also they'll be able to teach it. Um, so then we ask ourselves, what is sound doctrine? Um, I think uh, they, uh, as we go on, I think the, uh, the more I share, I think uh, I, I, will, I will be able to point it out in the, in the passages that are coming below. So uh, we go on and uh, so we see, uh, he goes on to show us that those who are disqualified were in teaching sound doctrine. So the pastors, the reason why these overseers are going to be set up is so that they can teach sound doctrine and they can refute sound those who are not teaching. As we see in verse 10 and 11, where it says, for there are many rebellious men, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, who must be silenced because they are setting up, upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of studied gain. So Paul is telling Titus, the reason why I'm telling you to, uh, to, to, to choose leaders in the church and have these qualities is so that they can teach sound doctrine. And because there are those who are rising up, and they are teaching something contrary to sound doctrine, something that is different. And that's what we see in verse 10 and 11. So we'll ask ourselves, why is it so important to stop these people who are not teaching sound doctrine? And, and, and it is because most, we must ascertain the truth uh, is in the world, uh, uh, as long as, 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 as much as truth is in the world, there's also falsehood. So Paul is telling Titus, look, they, they, are, they are also men who are, uh, who are rising up to teach a doctrine different. There are also men who are rising up to teach a doctrine different from the uh, from from the doc, uh, uh, from 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 what I taught you, and from what we have been teaching others. And so you need to stop them. And then uh, we see in Titus uh, one thirteen to fourteen. Uh, he tells us that this testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them. Who the, the them is those who are not teaching sound doctrine. Reprove them severely so that they may be they may be sound in faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from that truth. So, verse thirteen to fourteen, uh, Paul tells Titus that this is a true testimony. For this reason, reprove them. The them is those who are not teaching sound doctrine so that they may so that they may uh, so that they may be sound in faith not paying attention to jewish myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth so we are seeing here that truth is very very vital and is very very important and that's why um paul is writing this episode to titus one is choose leaders who are mature in faith, he gives them the qualities, and then he tells him that these leaders and you, Titus, should be able to reprove, stop severely those who are not teaching sound doctrine. And then, um, then he goes on tell him, um, uh, okay, maybe we'll ask ourselves, but how will Titus know that these people are changing? Or how will he know or identify that sound doctrine is starting to have an impact um, and changing lives. We see that in, um, in the next verse, verse 14, that says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and, un and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But, but both their mind and their conscience are defiled. So for those who are not teaching sound doctrine, this would be an example of them. But those who are teaching sound doctrine, there will be a difference. Their mind and thoughts will be renewed. The change will start in their hearts, and this and their cautious will be renewed. And that's what that's the impact of sound doctrine. 
a sound doctrine will go on to make the people pure. It will make them renewed. Those that are defiled will no longer be defiled. And they will be renewed both in their cautious and in their mind. So he gives them instructions of elders at first in the church. He tells him, um, choose these elders. And then he tells them these elders need to teach sound doctrine. And then he shows him how to point out uh, to point out to those who are not teaching sound doctrine. And then he goes on to tell him the importance of sound doctrine. The, the importance is people who need to, uh, the, the importance of sound doctrine in our lives is it renews our minds, it renews our conscience, and it makes us pure. It makes us righteous. And that's why he's emphasizing sound doctrine. Um, and then the next thing he tells him that, um, uh, we see it in verse 15 and 16 of Titus 1. It says, they profess to know God, but their deeds, they deny him. By their deeds, they deny him, being detestable and disobedient, worthless for good deed. So this is the description of those who are not teaching sound doctrine or who are seated under uh, doctrine uh, that is defiled. But then the opposite is also true. Those who are seated under sound doctrine, are listening or are feeding on sound doctrine. We shall know them by their deeds, because it tells them they will profess to know. They, these people who don't know sound doctrine, they profess to know God. That is okay. But their deeds, but by their deeds, they deny him. So the opposite is also true. Those who are seated under sound doctrine, by their deeds, they will honor God. They will be obedient and we shall know them by their good works. That will be the fruit, that will be the evidence of those who are listening, who are listening, who are teaching sound doctrine. And then we come to Titus 2. At Titus 2, um, Timothy, uh, sorry, uh, Paul tells Titus uh, in verse 1, but as you, but as for you, speak the things which are fitting of sound doctrine. So I think this, this specific passage goes on to show the importance of having sound doctrine in our lives. Um, as Paul is continuously pounding and insisting on, on the need of sound doctrine uh, in the lives of one, the elders in the church, and now we are going to see the importance of sound doctrine in the people. So we are first seeing the importance of sound doctrine in the elders, choosing elders who have the qualities of, of sound doctrine, who are teaching sound doctrine, who are teaching sound teaching. And now what will be the effect of such godly leaders or godly men and women in the lives of the community or the church? That's what we see in, in Titus 2. It starts with verse 1 telling him, Titus 2, 1, but as of you speak the things which are fitting of sound doctrine. It says, but you, uh, Titus, you should speak sound doctrine. And then what will be the evidence of sound doctrine in the people? And that's why uh, uh, Paul lists down a few qualities. He says that the older men, um, verse 2, he says older men are to be temperate, uh, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and perseverance. Now that will be the evidence of sound doctrine in the lives of older men in the community or in the church. Older men will behave this way. All their attitude or their hearts will be changed and these will be the deeds or the fruit or the character that we see in them. Temperance, they'll be dignified, they'll be sensible uh, in faith, in love and perseverance. And then he goes on to show us another category, which is the older women. It says, but how will, then we, how will the older women be like? Uh, verse three says of Titus two, it says older women likewise have to be reverent in their behavior not uh, malicious gossips, no enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. So this will be the change in character or what we shall see um, uh, as older women in the community. This is how they will behave, who will be like. And then we see the next category, which is the younger women. It says they will love their husbands, love their children, be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands as, uh, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. 
So this will be the evidence of uh, uh, of young women in the community who are listening or who are feeding sound doctrine. This will be the evidence of that. And then young men, that's the next category. category. It says, young men likewise urge them to be sensible in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity in doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach. So the opponent will not will be put to shame, having nothing but to say about us. So he's telling uh, Titus that now when um, when we do teach sound doctrine, because remember I told him that in verse one of Titus one two, you Titus teach sound doctrine. And when you teach sound doctrine, this is what we shall. There will be the, this will be the evidence of the younger men. They will be sensible. Likewise, urge them. So because Titus is teaching sound doctrine, you will be able to urge young men, look, this is how you ought to behave. So this is the sound doctrine that is supposed to teach to the young men to be good examples in their deeds, in purity, above reproach, and having nothing, um, the opponent will have nothing to say about them. And then the last category, he lists are the slaves or employees, urge bold, bond servers to be subject to their own masters in everything, uh, to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, and not uh, pilfering, but showing all good faith so that they will adorn the, the doctrine of God, our Savior, in every respect. So this is how um, the, the, the slaves or bond servants or the workers will ought to behave. And um, so, from chapter one uh, to right now here, maybe a, a quick uh, review, maybe for those who have just joined. So Paul writes this epistle to Titus. Um, Paul had been to Crete and he had set up a couple of churches there, house churches, and he leaves Titus there to oversee them. And then he writes in this letter on how the people ought to uh, behave in the community. Uh, the first thing he tells him is how the, uh, the, the elders, those are the pastors or the overseers in the church, ought to be, or the, 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 um, the, these, uh, the people he will choose to be pastors, how their qualities, that the ones they will have are these, he lists them down. And then he goes on to tell him the reason why these men have to, are supposed to have these qualities is so that they can teach sound doctrine. Then he goes on to tell him, now you need to refute to those who are not teaching sound doctrine. And um, the reason why is because the doctrine will be, uh, the doctrine affects our lives. It affects what we do. It affects how we live. So you need to stop those who are not teaching sound doctrine. Then he urges him, but you, Titus, you need to teach sound doctrine. You need to be an example of sound doctrine. Then he gives him the list. Uh, of different categories of men, women, old men, older men, older women, young women, young men, how they ought to behave. The, the outcome of sound doctrine in the lives of these people will be this. This will be the fruit. Uh, the older men will behave this way. The young um, women will behave this way. The young men will behave this way. This will be the evidence. And then uh, we come to our verse, the two verses for today. Um, so remember, Paul is writing to Titus before he writes to us. And um, I think verse 11 and 12, he is reminding Titus of the fundamentals of sound doctrine. So remember, we asked the question, what is sound doctrine? And I think to me, these two verses are what are the definition of what sound doctrine is like. And he tells Titus that, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Um, verse 12 says, uh, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, um, righteously, and godly in the present age. Um, so Paul tells Titus, look, um, I want you to know that God has been very gracious. 
to give us what we do not deserve, and that is salvation. He sent his only son to die so that um, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That is salvation. And the evidence, uh, the gift of salvation, this evidence or this gift of salvation, it will bring healing. But first the healing, before it will be seen outwardly, it will first be in the heart. It will work in the hearts of men and it will bring transformation or changing of lives. It will change hearts. It will change people's thoughts. It will change the way people, um, the way people are internally. It will change their character. And then verse 12, or oh, before we go to verse 12, the other part is the changing of the heart is in, internal. Uh, it's God doing it. It's God doing it. The, 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 the verse 11, the grace, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. The sal uh, it's by the grace of God, or um, by grace meaning God giving us what we do not deserve, which is his son, uh, yeah, uh, by his graciousness, he has given us his son. And because of that, he, uh, his son has come and he has died, John 3, 16. And uh, because of him, we have this gift, which is salvation. And, um, but that is something Titus cannot see with his eyes. It is, it is, because we can't see, we can't see that you have gotten, you've believed or you've gotten saved with, with, with uh, just looking. Um, so salvation is by believing. You believe that Christ Jesus died, he rose again, and then you're saved. That is salvation. But then verse 12 will be the evidence of the salvation, which says, uh, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. So Titus, this is how he will be able to notice or to know those who have been, been impacted, who have truly believed, who have truly been by the power, who have truly been uh, impacted by the power of the grace of God through the gift of salvation. This is how he will know them. They will deny ungodliness and worldly desires, and they will live sensibly, they will live righteously, and they will live godly lives. So what is salvation? Sorry, so what is sound doctrine? Sound doctrine is this, that we believe that, that um, by the grace of God, he has given us something that we do not deserve. And this is his son to come and die for us. And that he has given this gift to any man who will believe. And this, this, um, this gift has an impact to transform lives, as we see in verse, uh, in verse 12. Um, so Paul tells him that Titus, the people will start living godly lives. They will deny worldly desires, and they will start living sensibly and righteously. And that's how you know that there has been a change in the heart and this change has started to affect their deeds. That's why it was very important that we go through the first parts, um, uh, the first chapter one and, uh, and ch the beginning of chapter two, so that you understand how, why Paul is writing. He's writing, giving him these different um, qualifications and the different evidence of fruit in the older men, in the older women, in the younger men, in the younger women. This is how you will know that this is how they will be, be like, or this will be the evidence of sound doctrine in their lives. So, so how do we apply these exhortations of Paul to Titus in our lives today? The first thing is, one is we ought to listen to sound doctrine. Uh, Paul tells Titus that, that the, uh, the true the true power of the gospel 
or of sound doctrine is that it changes hearts, that it changes lives, that it and it will be manifested in, in, in the way we live. So the first question that I'll ask you is um, one is uh, have you understood what sound doctrine is? And then two, sound doctrine really in this simplicity, I think is uh, understanding uh, the word of God and um, listening to it, reading it, studying it and applying it to our lives. And um, it's something that you can't do in one day. It's something that has to be daily. So how many of you uh, on this call today, I woke up today and spent time with God. How many of you had a quiet time? Uh, how many of you are actively studying your words? Uh, how many of you uh, on this call today have, um, have memorized verses one or two? But then also, who are you listening to? Um, what preachers or pastors are you listening to? Because at the end of the day, sound doctrine will impact your life, will impact how you live, it will impact um, uh, your lifestyle. So uh, Titus, Paul emphasized to Titus the importance of sound doctrine in the community in Crete. And I think it's still the same message to us today that we ought to listen to sound doctrine. It tells him these are the qualities of the men and women uh, that uh, uh, the, 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 the leaders in the church. Uh, these are the, their qualities. They ought to teach sound doctrine. So even us today, we ought to listen to people who are teaching sound doctrine. But the same, um, not just that, it goes further that even us, we are being diligent enough to study our own word. Uh, how will you know the doctrine if you're not studying it? How will you know that it is not sound or it is not correct if you're not spending time in it? Mm -hmm. I was told that um, in the bank, if they want to know that, if they, they, when they are teaching people counterfeit notes, they expose them to the, uh, the, um, the genuine notes. So that if you've been exposed to the genuine note so many times, it will be very easy for you as soon as you see the counterfeit to notice it. So same thing with the word of God. If we're not spending time in it daily reading it, there will be no way we'll be able to identify sound doctrine when we hear it. We shall be swept by every doctrine that comes our way to lead us. But that, that's not what Paul is telling us today through this letter to Titus. He's telling us, look, there ought to be sound doctrine in our lives because it's going to impact the way we live. It's going to impact our lifestyles. So the first thing is I leave you with today is going back to the basics, reading your Bible every morning, every day, um, setting aside a quiet time. And in this quiet time, you actively study the word of God. If you do not, I think... Um, if you do not know how to do this, I think the navigators are teaching people how to study the word. You could join the navigators. Um, I think there's also Mazima College. I think, uh, and there are other tools that are available for you to, to learn how to study the word of God. But it is important that we are all studying God's word and we are feeding on it daily. That's the only way we'll be able to know sound doctrine and not and we'll be able to identify and that that is not. Second thing is, um, I believe each of us falls in a certain category, specific category on this call. You're either an older, an elder in the church, or you're, you're, you're an older man, or you're an older woman, or you're a young man, or you're a young woman, or you're an employee. I think all of us on the call fall in a, a specific category. And Paul went on to list specific qualities that ought to be evidenced in those who are being impacted by sound doctrine. So when you go through these, these qualities, would you say that you, we can, you can stand up and say that you're a good example in your community, in your church? Um, so the, the second thing is I, um, 
I will implore you to go back, read these qualities, and let, allow the Holy Spirit to search your heart where there is need to change, where there is need for growth, where there is need for transformation. Uh, because we ought to set a good example as the young men, as the young women, as the older men, as the older women, and as the pastors. Um, and I know it, it, it may be, it may seem overwhelming. Um, the qualities that are listed there may seem overwhelming and it may seem challenging um, to attain this kind of uh, uh, righteousness because when you read all these qualities, it, it seems like it, it's very hard to be this kind of person. But I think that's the importance of today's message. And the importance of today's message it is to remind you of the power of the grace of God to you, a believer. Just to remind you that you're not doing this in your own strength, that you're not going to become this person listed, these qualities listed here. You're not going to become this person in your own strength. That's the grace of God. It has appeared to all men, including you on this call, and it is going to give you the power. It's going to give you the power to transform you and make you into that person. Into that, make you into that person of verse 12, uh, of, of Titus 2, 12, to make you that person of the qualities that have been listed. So my encouragement to you is you're not doing this. You're not going to do this on your own. That's the power of the grace of God. We could not attain salvation on our own. We could not come to God on our own. And salvation is a gift. We do not earn it. We receive it. So... One is your understanding that the power uh, of the grace of God is what's going to enable you to transform and to become this kind of person. Um, so I, 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 I implore you to rest in him, uh, to depend on him, because he has given the grace to all men, including you and me, on this call. Um, and if you've never given your life to Christ, I think today is a good day to, to think about it. Or why would God pour out his grace and give a gift of salvation to all men and you're not part of this? I made this decision a couple of years ago and I continue to tell everyone it's the best decision I've ever made in my life. So if you're in this call and you've never given your life to Christ, Titus, uh, Titus, 2.11 tells us that the grace of God has appeared to all men, even you who is not yet saved. Even you too is not yet saved. And, and because of that grace, it, it gives you this gift of salvation. So I hope today you will consider it. I hope today you will think about giving your life to Christ. And um, also you who is a believer who is on the call, but you see you've been struggling um, when you search your heart and you look at the different uh, qualities uh, of um, uh, of the, uh, that are listed. Uh, you show uh, you, you fall short in a couple of them. Uh, even you today is to remind you of that power, still that power of the grace of God. It's also it's also still evident and still enough for you. Uh, and that grace is still sufficient for you to help you uh, and to, to give you a desire. One is uh, to, to hunger for the word of God. Because, yes, you may feel sorry for yourself, but it, the change and true transformation is going to start from you studying the word of God. So I pray that as Sammy writes, uh, as I dear pants for the living waters, so my heart pants for you, Lord. I pray that you... You have a hunger. God will awaken a hunger in you, believers, and his call, a hunger and a desire for his word. It is his word that's going to change you. It is not you feeling sorry for yourself. It is you spending time in his word. That's why you be, um, you will be transformed by some doctrine. And his grace has given you the power also to live a godly life. It has given you the power to say no to ungodliness and to live a life that honors him. So that's the power to the unbeliever. To the unbeliever, it is the gift of salvation. To you, the believer, too, it is a hunger for his word. And the second thing is to say no uh, to sin and to live a life that 
honors him. So I pray that you will trust him, that you will have you allow this power of the grace of God to transform you today. Let us pray. Okay. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for today. Yeah. I want to thank you for first of all, it's a privilege uh, that we can be in your presence. Um, I'm reminded of a writer who once said that it's only a child who can wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a cup of milk. It's only a child who can wake up a king for a cup of milk at 3 a.m. And you say that that is who you are. You have, you're like that child. You can wake up God at any time and talk to him. Friends, we are like that child. That child who can wake up a king. You have that grace to go to God at any time, to approach his throne of grace boldly. So Father, it's a privilege. We know we do not deserve to be in your presence, but by your mercy, you have allowed us and you invited us. So we say thank you that you allow sinners like us to come and commune with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Father, for your mercy, for your grace, for the for your grace, for the power of your grace. This grace that has given us salvation, a gift that we do not deserve, but you've given us because you have chosen to give it to us, Lord. We do not deserve it. None of, none of us deserves it. None of us has ever done anything to earn it. But by your mercy and your grace, you've given it to us. Thank you so much, Father. Thank you so much, Father. I pray that um, you walk in the heart of everyone that is on the call. I continue to convict them. Um, first of all, I think Paul today was trying to emphasize the importance of sound doctrine and how it should be evident in every believer's life. And how we need sound doctrine. But I acknowledge that most of us have not grown the discipline of studying your word. Most of us have not grown the discipline of spending time in your word, spending time in prayer, spending time meditating and applying your word. So I pray that you convict every single person here, that you will work in their hearts to work in their hearts, create that hunger for your word, that they will spend time in it, they will read it, they will study it. And then I also pray for a change in hearts. Lord, those who may be struggling with any sin, Lord, or any habit that does not honor you. I pray that, Father, still this grace, this grace is sufficient for them to say not to ungodliness and to live a life that is sensible, that is righteous, and that is pleasing to you. Remind them that they are no longer slaves to sin and that by your grace and by this gift of salvation, you have given them the power to say not to sin and to say yes to godliness. Remind them today. Remind them today, Father, those who feel weary, those who feel tired, those who feel like they can't go on, those who are sad, those who are depressed, those who feel like they are overwhelmed, Father, remind them today that your grace is sufficient, your power, you've poured it out, it is there. They only simply need to come and access it through your word. They only need to come and access it through a daily study of your word. They only need to come and access it through a daily communion with you in prayer. I pray that we we start to appreciate this, this, this grace that God has given us. We may sit here and we talk as much as we can, but if we do not live and go apply these things that the Lord is telling us, if everything is in vain. So I pray that these things don't enter from one ear and enter and leave from the other. I pray that you will pick something today, that you will pick something today, that you will hold on to something today. And I pray. If you forget everything, do not forget this one thing, sound doctrine, going back to the basics, to reading the word of God, studying it, enjoying it. So Father, I pray that also we will not just commune with you, study your word for the importance of just taking it all. But we will be those Christians who enjoy just being in your presence. We will be those Christians who enjoy you, who enjoy you so much that we just want to come and commune with you, come, come to come, to come and spend time with you in your 
So create that hunger in us, create that desire in us, Lord. I know everyone who's on this call has, they have been intentional. 6 p.m. they could be somewhere else, Lord, but they have taken off their time to come and, and, and listen in and pray. So I pray, Father, that you will bless them. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, Father, everyone, the desires of their hearts, that you will bless them, align their will with your will. May they let go of that is that is not of your will, and may they be conformed to yours, Lord. So bless them, Father. Bless them, Father. Bless them, Father. Watch over them. Watch over their families. Watch over their going in. Watch over their coming out. Watch over their work. Watch over their businesses. Watch over their marriages. Watch over their children. Watch over everything that concerns them, Lord. May they, may they experience your goodness in the land of the living. Those who are going through trials, trials, Lord, remind them that you're with them, that you have not left them, that you're not forsaken them. Remind them that you're still faithful to the end, that they not give up. I pray for everyone here, one, someone who may be trying to give up. I pray that you will not give up. Remind you that the Lord is still present, that he's still attentive, and he still hears prayer and still answers prayer. So don't give up. Hold on. The Lord is faithful. He will come through. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to be in your presence, that you allow us to be in your presence, you allow us to commune with you, and that you allow us and you share our prayers. And that, Father, that you answer our prayers, Lord, that there is no prayer of us that comes out your way that you don't answer. Some you answer with yes, and we thank you. Some you answer with wait, and we thank you. Even to some you answer no, and we still thank you. Lord, we do not come to you because we want to get answers. No, we come to you because we love you. That though you tell us no wait to the things that we desire, yet we will still trust you. Yet we will still hold on to you. Yet we will still believe you. And yet we will still know that you're faithful. And know that even in there, your will is still sovereign. And you're still working out everything for our good and for your glory. And may that love that you have for us continue to convict us, to persevere in prayer, to persevere and to hold on to your word and to daily die to our selfishness, daily die to our sin. And may your word transform us and we live lives that are godly so that when the world sees us, we shall be true beacons of light that represent Christ and reflect Christ to the world, to the glory and end of your name. In Jesus' mighty name I've prayed. Amen.